Sunday Sports Show. We're broadcasting to you live from the Temple Bar Studios of DCTV. I'm Breffney Early. And I'm Claire Keogh. Over the next hour, we'll be giving you the most diverse and eclectic mix of the Irish sporting scene seen anywhere on Irish TV. We're going to be talking to Avril Copeland, who's taken part in the Tavern Triathlon. Ailish McSweeney, international sprinter, is going to be taking part in the Sporting Spotlight, while Andy McGeady is going to be shooting the breeze with us about the action over the weekend. But first up, a warm-up with the Dublin Hurricanes out in Croker Park in Clondalkin. I've been playing for the Dublin Hurricanes for three years now and uh, I've always been a fan of baseball, I always enjoyed watching at the telly and I was playing cricket over here in Ireland and uh, it was it was enjoyable but uh, I was driving all the way to Wicklow to play cricket and in the end convenience won out so I live quite close to Corker Park where we are right now and uh, I had always been a, a big big fan of the sport so I took a chance, sent an email to the Dublin Hurricanes and yeah, they welcomed me with open arms, the beginners were more than welcome so I haven't looked back. Baseball is really in its infancy over here in Ireland. It's been played for almost two decades, but it's still developing as a sport. It's very much a minority sport. There are um, there are eight clubs in, in Ireland, uh, they're all over the country, most of which are in the Greater Dublin area. There are three clubs in Dublin and one in Greystones just outside. We've also got clubs as far away as Belfast, and uh, there's one that takes uh, that takes control of the whole Munster area. There's a club in West Clare, and there's a club, club in Cavan. So it's got a great reach, and we're trying to expand that all the time. But really. It's still a developing sport, so we're just looking for as many people as we can to, to get interested in the sport and get playing. There is not, not a big difference probably in the level of skills uh, between baseball here in Ireland and baseball in Slovakia, because uh, this game is, 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 is also just, just coming up and growing and uh, getting new people coming in in Slovakia as well. So it's just pretty young. Uh, in Slovakia they play, I think, around 20, uh, 20 years or 18 years, so it's around the same, same time as it started over here in Ireland. Uh, for the fans, sometimes the, the game, because it takes so long and, uh, and uh, it, it, it could look like a boring game, but everything, what I like about baseball is that everything what happens in baseball happens in seconds, split of seconds, so you have to decide fast what you're going to play, where you're going to play. So that's what I love about baseball, that everything is, uh, everything is, uh, everything is coming in a big speed, you know, you have to, you have to be fast. <laughs> on television recently there was the uh, there was the World Baseball Classic which is the pinnacle of international baseball and Ireland are striving to get to that level and we hope to get there eventually but we're not really reaching that level at the moment. We're at the next tier down with the European B Championships along with the likes of Spain who would be one of the traditional heavy hitters. So as a nation we're developing our baseball, a lot of our team is, is made up of homegrown players which is very positive and uh, of course a couple of, um, a couple of Americans of Irish extraction who can really add a little bit of oomph to the lineup as well. So we've got a continuous struggle to try and uh, reach the next level, the A tier of, of European uh, of European Championships, and then from that hopefully we can strike on and achieve great things. I've always been attracted to the game of baseball since I was a child. Um, I would have grown up playing hurling like most Irish kids, and you know watching the telly and watching baseball, it just all fell into the other. You know, I'm from Dublin originally, and I play baseball. I guess I was introduced to. Uh, through a Venezuelan friend of mine, I used to play soccer with him and he said that we had a baseball team here in Dublin and so we, I joined his team and we just kept playing since then. It's very different in reality to how we see it on TV. Um, there's not as much money in it obviously. Uh, the guys are, it's more about the team sport over here rather than the individual sport that it can be in, in America, you know, it's very much statistically uh, rated in America for the individual rather than the team sport itself. Whereas here we play as a team. Well, I mean, you should get involved in this sport because it's small, it's, it's growing. Um, the people who play it are very, very nice, good lads, you know. Um, it's a team sport, it's, uh, it's, it's a great way of learning a new sport, and, and uh, the different cultures is, is definitely one of the attractions for myself. You know, we've got Polish lads, we've got Venezuelan lads, American lads and Irish lads and it's a great bunch of lads at that. 
This is Peter O'Malley Field here in Cork Park in South Dublin. It's the most important facility for Baseball Ireland. It's our national baseball facility. It was built using funds donated by Peter O'Malley, who was at the time the owner of the Los Angeles Dodgers baseball organization. He's no longer the owner, he's since sold on, but he's still a very good supporter of, of Baseball Ireland. And uh, in July this year, we're going to have the first ever Peter O'Malley Invitational Tournament. We're hoping to bring teams in from the States and Europe to, to play the best of Irish baseball right here in Cork Park. Juvenile baseball is actually quite popular in Ireland, uh, possibly even more popular than adult baseball. There are, there are lots, of, lots of clubs uh, catering for kids between the ages of 8 and 16. And uh, if anybody's interested in getting involved or finding their local club, they can just look up baseballireland.com. Uh, it's got full details of the Little League out there. It really is a great sport for kids. It teaches an awful lot of an awful lot about teamwork, about cooperation, uh, as well as being a sport that kids can really get involved in at almost any age and any athletic ability. The catcher is actually showing uh, to the pitcher what, which, which, uh, which pitches he wants him to throw. So, for example, I show him if I want a fastball on, uh, and on the weak side of the plate, if I want a low one, high, high pitch. So, catcher, catcher also is important uh, position because catcher needs to know all the, all the uh, players which are playing against against you. you. You need to know kind of the guys, like which kind of pitches they like to, to hit, which kind of pitches they don't like or, or they can't hit. So and then you decide what you're gonna what you're gonna show to your pitcher. I've been hurt. I've been hurt few times, few times in baseball, but most of the time was when I when I realized was was my fault actually. Yeah, yeah. Or kind of I could I could avoid I, I I could avoid it. You know, like for example, once last year uh, last year happened to me that that uh, the end of my finger broke, but it was just because uh, the guy which was swinging swinging the swinging the bat he just sliced the ball a little bit. And I forgot to keep my hand be behind my be behind my leg. So if, if my if my hand would be behind my leg, it it wouldn't catch the it wouldn't catch the finger. Players come from all over the world. I suppose there's probably a preconceived notion that a lot of the players would be expat Americans, but actually. Baseball is the most popular sport in so many different countries and we have players from Korea, Japan, Canada, Mexico, Venezuela, uh, all throughout Europe we've got uh, German players, Slovakian, Czechs, Romanians. So baseball it really is a very international sport and our league here in Ireland has got a really international flavour. Uh, there are eight clubs playing in Ireland, we're operating an A League and a B League and we're always looking for new players of absolutely any level of ability or experience so if anybody's interested in and finding out a bit more about baseball and where their local club would be and how to get in contact with them, they can just visit baseballireland.com for all the details. And that was the Dublin Hurricanes out in their purpose-built stadium out in Corky Park. We're going to move on and take a look at the weekend's action and joining me to go through, starting with rugby, Andy McGeady. Welcome to the show. Thanks, bro. Andy, it has to be talking about Leinster. Great weekend, great performance. They're in the Amman Cup final, but talk us through the game yesterday. Yeah, it was a really interesting game. It was a good, uh, a good start to the weekend's action. Uh, it was very much the case you saw Leinster back to some of their brilliant best. Um, certainly there was a packed crowd. It was a magnificent sporting spectacle, if you know what I mean. There was the beautiful spring sunshine was out. Leinster came to entertain. Beerits were the willing victims. Uh, and everyone went home pretty happy. The weather does help, particularly with the way the style of play that Leinster have in terms of getting it out wide and, and swinging it around and, and getting running over for tries. How much does the can, can they get the conditions help in that situation? Yeah, it's an interesting thing at the moment because there's some people are pretty strong proponents of summer rugby. Now, it's not something we're going to see today or in the next day here in the Northern Hemisphere. But when you see a dry track like that, a uh, lovely, bright, dry day, and Leinster selecting a team with Saxon and Madigan um, in the midfield, they certainly took advantage of it very quickly. You saw tries very early in the game with a brilliant set piece move, uh, with Toner taking a long line out to the back through the East and Athewa running through and then popping it up to Jamie Heasley running through. Now, Beerits then kept it fairly tight for the rest of the first half, and I think the crowd were getting a bit nervous. Had they seen the best from Leinster too soon? But then with two tries right before half time, they pretty much put the game to bed. Yeah, no, Leinster obviously have been there, thereabouts at Heineken level over the last few years. Is there a noticeable difference between the standard in the Heineken and the Amla? I think there is, and it's not so much when they have the ball in hand, but I think what we've seen with the last two rounds of the Amlin in particular is a decline in the defensive aspect of the game. So tackles are missed. People just fall off. They're not quite as clued in. So if you took the Amlin quarterfinal weekend, I think it was Gloucester against Biritz, there was 57 tackles missed in the game. That doesn't happen in a Heineken Cup match. And we saw then the intensity of the semifinals both yesterday and today. Uh, it's very tight rugby, it's championship rugby, but that's a big, big step up from the Amman, and that's where 
Leinster have seen it and done it in the Heineken Cup. They've taken this into the Ammon now and we've seen the results by dispatching Wasps and Birrits very handily. Munster had a big win in the quarterfinals. They were repaid yesterday with a trip to Claremont. T promised to be pretty tricky from the first couple of exchanges. It didn't look like it was going to be a good day for Munster, but they, they almost snuck it at the end. They did, and I think you saw that, that big match mentality that is now ingrained in the Munster psyche really come through, especially in the second half. Claremont are a terrifically strong side. They've got a very strong pack, very strong set piece, but their backs can destroy you from anywhere in the pitch. They can score more tries from any other situation than almost any team in the competition. Like It's not just take the ball off the top and rumble up the pitch. They can hit you from anywhere. And Munster did very, very well to keep tight. Like If they'd been within 10, 13 points at half time, I think they'd have taken that and said, right, well, if we can get a try, then at least it makes it very interesting. And that's exactly what happened. But Claremont could have been out of sight at halftime. They could have been. There was a couple of crucial situations in the first half where Munster got turnover ball uh, very close to their own line. And the number of times it happened, you're looking at potentially a 10 to 15 point swing in that match. If that happens, Claremont are out of sight. We saw them do that against Montpellier uh, in their quarterfinal. They just, they eased onto the gas in the second half and they pulled away very easily. Uh, it's to Munster's eternal credit that they didn't let that happen. And Claremont only scored three points in the second half. And I think I'm right in saying they didn't score in the last 30 minutes. That is quite extraordinary. And for Munster have been within six, six points at the end of the game, it really was a magnificent performance. The likes of O'Connell and O'Gara, hugely influential still for Munster. They're getting to the end of their careers. How much longer can we see them in red jersey? And how long are they going to actually make an impression on the game? Hopefully for some time to come. Uh, Paul an interesting case because even though he's been around for a terrifically long time, because of injuries, he's played a lot fewer games than, for example, Duncan O'Callaghan has. Uh, O'Gara now has been around for a few years and it's probably up to him whether he wants to keep it going or not. Uh, he's now exited the Irish scene. It's up to Munster to see can they find an arrangement where he feels that he is still valuable and they also feel that they can find a place for him in the setup. Will a change in the Irish management maybe see him back in the Ireland team? I wouldn't think so. Um, if he continued with the form he's, he's playing in now, that th those two rounds of the Heineken Cup, he really did look back to maybe when he was sort of 30, 31 years old. He played a very pragmatic game. He did what he was good at and didn't try to do what he's not. And he even came up with some turnover ball himself. He, he aided in some choke tackles against Harlequins, which isn't something I'm not sure I can ever remember seeing him do. But this was a Raj who was putting himself... Uh, behind the team and I think that's what the, the Munster Edic has been about traditionally. It's what we've seen him do and if he can pass that on to the younger generation coming through, it's worth keeping him around. Sexton's off to France at the end of the year. With Claremont being so impressive yesterday, are we looking at a French domination of European competition? Uh, probably not for the simple reason that they, they do find such value in their own competition. So in the top 14, every single team wants to win that above the Heineken Cup. And Claremont are probably a singular exception in that regard. They've come so close twice, with Leinster pipping them both at the RES and in Bordeaux last season. And every other French team, they're probably going to send the odd dodgy away selection, except for Claremont. They will always put this first until they win it. So if we see Toulon now beat Claremont in the final in Dublin on May 18th, I think you'll see Claremont continue to wreak vengeance on the competition next year. Are there tickets still available for the final? I don't know, actually. It's a very good point. Certainly the Amelin's very tricky now with, with Leinster involved. In, in the RDS? In the RDS. It's a very small capacity, but they've already uh, given out a huge amount of tickets for that game. The tickets have been available for sale for many months, and I think Leinster have about 13,000 season ticket holders. They certainly don't have 13,000 tickets available for Leinster, let alone any travelling stat fans. Joe Schmidt is the, the big name on the lips of everybody talking about the Irish job. I know there's been a lot of talk during the week about it. Can we expect to see Joe Schmidt appointed as the Ireland job and when, maybe? Well, it looks like there's going to be an announcement this week. That's certainly what a lot of the papers seem to be saying. And I think today, in a number of the Sunday papers, we saw Matt O'Connor, the Leicester coach, named, well, not as the, the surefire replacement for Schmidt, but certainly um, easing the ground and letting us know that he's been in Dublin. He's been talking to some of the senior players. And certainly the name hadn't been in the conversation before publicly, so maybe that's what they're trying to do here, to ease transition. I suppose non 100% committed rugby fans wouldn't be familiar with O'Connor. Tell us a bit about him and what you can expect to see if he is unveiled as the Leinster manager next year. Well, he's a Aussie, um, so it's another Southern Hemisphere appointment if it comes to pass. He's a fairly young man, he's 42, and has a reputation of being a good backs coach. Uh, that would certainly continue with the Schmidt model of attacking play, 
being unafraid to spread it wide, as we've seen throughout his time in charge. He took over a Michael Checker team, which was um, a terrifically effective uh, team. But that first Heineken Cup they won, it was actually with fairly attritional defensive play. It's something that maybe Leinster fans don't remember because you just remember the triumph. But the rugby we've seen in a couple of years since with Schmidt has been hugely more entertaining, um, especially from that backside. So if O'Connor is the man, he comes with that reputation again that might be the way that they're smoothing this transition both for Ireland and for Leinster. Okay, Leinster chances in the final of the Amelin? Uh, should be very good based on the last two games, based on, you know, we're seeing the end of Johnny Sexton, we're seeing the end of Issa Natiwa. He'll be almost a bigger loss than Sexton in terms of the value he's brought to Leinster in his time here. The one little thing is that Stad need to win that match to get into the Heineken Cup next year. Uh, that's something that Leinster don't actually have to do. They're all about, they want to win the trophy in front of their own plans. They want to send some players away, uh, having sort of sealed, put, put a nice sealing moment on their time with Leinster. Uh, it's do or die for Stad. They're seven points behind Perpignan uh, in the top 14. Uh, it's, it's, it's all or nothing for them. Yeah, is there anything else rugby related that might be of interest? I think the Lions selection coming up this Tuesday is the big one. Uh, we saw the Munster, of course, lost to Claremont yesterday. Uh, Toulon went to Twickenham this afternoon uh, and beat Saracens, which was a pretty dour game. It was all kicks, no tries at all, and Johnny Wilkinson comfortably outshone uh, Owen Farrell, um, who is generally seen as the, the young pretender to Johnny's throne as the, the kicking English fly half. It's certainly given Warren Gatlin something to think about because in the game today we saw three English fly halves on show. We saw Owen Farrell start against Wilkinson, and then we saw uh, Charlie Hudson come on. Now, Charlie Hudson and Johnny Wilkinson both out Sean Farrell, who's supposed to be the nailed on back up to Johnny Sexton for the Lions tour. So it's certainly given something to think about. You'll have a lot of Welsh people wanting a lot of Wales uh, players there because they won the championship this year. Uh, England traditionally would expect a large contingent, but Gatland has already got himself into some trouble saying that maybe a lot of Englishmen in the side wouldn't be good in terms of media exposure. And then the Irish people, we've had a good core of the team for a long time now, and if you read the papers, people expect between anything from 9, 10, 11, some people even think there might be 12 Irish lines. I think that's a bit optimistic. I think we really only have six or seven guys who are nailed on. There are a lot of other guys who were in that, mur that murky water. If you had to put names on shirts, and you, it was up to you to kind of pick who's going to make it, who do you think you'd be seeing in a red jersey? From, from the Ireland? From the Irish? Yeah, you're looking at uh, Sexton, O'Driscoll, O'Brien, uh, Paul O'Connell, of course. And then you're getting into, uh, will the, will, do they think Tommy Bowes fit? Uh, has Rob Kearney done enough? Has Rory Best played himself out of a Lions jersey? Because after the Autumn Internationals, he was probably the nailed on starting too. He's missed a lot of ball in the line out both for Ulster and for uh, Ireland. So it's a question whether if his player in the park, which is still superb, he's an incredible turnover artist to stealing ball from the opposition. Um, is that enough for Gatlin to pick him? And then after that, you've got Jamie Heaslip, who looks to have nailed on his place after an incredible performance um, in that match against Biarritz. And then there's a couple of other guys who are on the fringes. Uh, Dunica Ryan, um, Keen Healy's probably on the plane. Maybe Rickard Stars or Mike Ross might go, depending on the kind of rugby he wants to play. Okay, one thing we were talking about earlier on the radio, um, the UCI, their Congress is coming up soon. The Irish heavily involved in that. Pat McQuaid, obviously, the internationally renowned, or, well, maybe, yeah, internationally renowned is probably the right word, uh, president of the UCI. Cycling Ireland put in his nomination for the position again at this year's Congress, but it's kicked a bit of a hornet's nest up in the last couple of days. Yeah, the situation seems to have changed. So for the background to anyone who might be unfamiliar with this, uh, two weeks ago, roughly, uh, the, at Cycling Ireland's uh, board meeting, they put through their nomination for Pat McQuaid to be re-elected as president of the UCI. Now, since then, there seems to have been some questions asked or if they followed all their correct internal policies and procedures for actually putting together that nomination. They seem to be so worried about this that they put out a press release two weeks later saying that um, they're actually going to hold an EGM to say, right, we, need, probably need, we probably need to have a wider vote on this. This will have satisfied a number of people in the internal cycling community in Ireland and with some within Cycling Ireland itself, who certainly saw the, the renomination of McQuaid as a major PR blunder, and, and that's at, at, at the very minimum. Um, we'll see where this goes, but certainly it's worth paying attention to the radio, 
to the sports news over the next few days because there could be a number of very interesting stories coming out about it. Yeah, I think there's a lot more people than just the, the population of the cycling community in Ireland looking at this situation across the globe. Andy, thank you very much for joining us, coming in and filling us with in all the actions of the weekend. Um, we're moving our attention now to a completely different sport. Cycling, running, swimming. It's triathlon. And one of the events that's coming up in the next few weeks is the Fingal 3D Sprint Triathlon out in the Aquatic Centre, sponsored by Europe Car. We earlier had a chat with Vanessa Fenton of the 3D Triathlon Club, and here's what we had to talk to her about. Well, next up, we have a fantastic uh, triathlete in the studio with us to talk about the Europe Car 3D Sprint Triathlon that's coming up next month. Vanessa Fenton, thank you very much for joining us. Not at all. Thank you, Brethany and Claire, for having me on. Uh, we're very excited once more in May, on May the 19th, Sunday, May the 19th, to have the Europe Car 3D Sprint Triathlon. Uh, it's a great race for beginners. We're also very excited because we have a junior competition, not just for the over eights who take place in an aquathon, but we also have a lot of the junior elites uh, that Triathlon Ireland have been developing through their development squad uh, taking part as well. So it really is a race, not just for the beginner triathlon or triathlete, but all the way up to uh, junior elites. It's, it's a great day out. We'd strongly encourage people to enter it. Entry can be found online at the moment. Tell us exactly what's involved. So if someone wants to get involved, triathlon, obviously, we know it's a swim, a cycle and a run. What distance are we talking? Yeah, well, this is a sprint distance, so it's beginner friendly. It's a 750 metre swim in the nice, safe environment of the National Aquatic Centre. After that, you're out to the transition area, just in the grounds of the National Aquatic Centre, on your bike, 20 kilometres relatively flat, flat for Ireland around the uh, grounds there and then finishing off with a five kilometre run. So it's very doable as your first triathlon and indeed for a lot of people on the circuit, it's, it was the first one that they've done. So we'd, we'd encourage people, if you're thinking of giving it a go, this is a good one to start off with. Good one for anybody thinking that, you know, they've done a marathon now, next step. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, marathon running is it's fantastic and it's, there's a huge groundswell of support at the moment. Triathlon a little bit different, a um, little bit easier on the, the limbs and a fantastic social event as well. Uh, like running at the moment, there is a social element to it. And you compete against your, your peers. I mean, not everybody's there to win, but everybody's there to do their best on the day. So I think from that element, it's, it's, it's a great sport to take part in. Who exactly are you expecting to show up on the day? We will have a mixture. I haven't actually looked at the entry list yet. I know last year uh, we had Mary Boland who won it and she went on to take first place in the National Series. So that'll show you the calibre of the top end. But for every one person at, at that end of the field, there's a lot more just taking part in the day. You'll find people, people often think about triathlon, I need to get the gear. You don't need to get the gear. You can get an old bike. And f certainly for the first season I raced, I just got a, an old bicycle with a shopping it's basket on the front. It's very intimidating, though, when you show up with your little mountain <laughs> bike and everyone else has no, the ca no. carbon fibre rims. That, and that's it. You see, they don't all have the carbon fibre rims. But you feel like they do. You do, but I feel that still after racing for over <laughs> 10 years. When I get to the start line, I'm like, oh, my God, everybody looks so bling today. And <laughs> I have to put on my fake tan and things like that to feel a little bit better about myself. It's all in your head. Just take part. There will always be somebody there just starting off who is not bling at all and people progress in their own time so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't let the image put off anybody it's not the case at all it's very very inclusive it's a participation sport tell us a little bit about your own involvement in the sport because you came to the sport quite late I did I didn't really start any sporting activity until my, my I suppose my 30s and I'm not going to say how long I've been doing it now <laughs> for but um, a year or two a year or two, exactly. Yeah, we'll we'll yeah. leave it at that. But certainly I, I, I wasn't a particularly, like as a teenager in my teens, I was pretty fit, but more as a country person running around fields and a little bit of horse riding. And I swam, but not, not, not a proper swimmer or anything. And then in my 20s, I just smoked and drank and it was fabulous. But then obviously in my 30s, I, I, that wasn't enough. So I started getting into sport and getting into triathlon. That's fantastic. So it's been and, and you're saying this is open to people of all ages as well? It is. I mean, we've got the juniors there from eight years old up. So if any parents are out there thinking that their kid could do with a bit of a challenge, the distances are obviously much, much shorter for the juniors. The details are on the website again. But from eight up, eight years old, people can take part. And it's great to see the juniors there on the day being, being cheered on. Then we have the junior athletes. And then anybody else. There's people there from 18 to, to 55, 60 taking part. So it really is a very inclusive sport. In terms of the, the calibre of people who take part in this, some people will be looking at this and saying, you know, I can't do it, I'm not fit enough, I'm not able to swim well enough, or maybe, I don't know, 
they've had a couple of kids. But in fact, you're in the same boat. You've got three young children. I have three young children, so it, it's, I mean, running is a very time efficient sport. You put on your runners, 20 minutes later, you've done your run. Cycling, a lot of people commute in and out of work so they can fit it into their daily exercise routine. And swimming, yeah, people sometimes need to learn, but it, it can be done. I think you yourself came to swimming pretty mm. late, Breffney. Yeah, very you, much you so. You can now float as opposed to sink, so I wouldn't let yeah, people... Yeah, that's probably the best explanation <laughs> of what I do. Float, just about float, maybe with a little bit of forward proportion. all the time, yes. so I, I wouldn't let um, the lack of swimming experience put people off. Certainly do seek out lessons. Don't turn up on the day without having done a little bit of training. To, you have to be able to complete the distance. You have the to swim be, is really the, the key The swim thing. is important. I mean, you, you do have to be able to complete the distance, but I mean, there are an awful lot of swim clubs around and you will find beginner's lessons. So people, I mean, take the plunge. To put it into context, 750 metres is 30 lengths of a traditional pool, a 25 metre pool. Yeah. Yeah, it's not exactly a short distance if you're not that comfortable in the it's water. It's not a short distance, no. It is a challenge. But um, first of all, the R1 is 750 metres. There are other events in the calendar that are shorter again. I think some of them are as short as 500 metres swim. And again, it does take a bit of training, but why not? It's a good challenge. It's progression over time as well. Do any of your own kids take part? Uh, not yet. I was actually looking at the entry form and they're all, if I know about the eight-year-olds, they're seven and under. So. Do they want to? Do they want to though? Uh, I'll be one of these pushy parents. <laughs> no, I'll ask them next year and see what, what they want to do. I hope they will though, but we'll see. We'll wait and see. So it's coming up next month. How long do people have to enter? Uh, I think the closing date is Monday, May the 13th. So they need to get their entries in, but I wouldn't hesitate until the last minute. Every year it, it does tend to sell out. It's a popular event. It's a good day out. So if you're thinking about doing it, I would go online now. I think the details are on fingal.3dtry.com. But Google, Google Fingal Triathlon, Europe Car, Fingal 3D Triathlon, and it will show up on your Google search. Triathlon really has had a huge renaissance over the last few years in the sport. They've gone from maybe a handful of events across the country 10 or 12 years ago to where there's a handful of events every week. You know. Every weekend. I think, T.I., I'm probably wrong with these numbers, but I think it's about 8,000 members of Triathlon Ireland at the moment and well over 120, 170 events taking part. So there really is an event in your locality suitable for whatever level you're at. So, yeah, it's gone through a huge, huge, huge groundswell. And you'd certainly recommend it for anybody of any age. I would. Is there anything? No excuses. I would. I think it's a good sport to come back to as well. Um, I would. I'd recommend it for anybody now. Why triathlon and not maybe just straight running or cycling or swimming? Yeah, I think one of the great benefits of triathlon is the cross-training element. People tend to go out and say, I'm going to start running, I'm going to do a marathon, and invariably after six weeks, they get injured. They stop, they lose interest, and that's the end of it. With this swim and bike element, the cross-training prevents injuries, especially for the over 30s. And I think because of that, people stick with it a lot longer. Plus as well, it's divided into age groups. So you're not just competing against the entire field, but you're competing against your own age category, 25 to 30, 30 to 35, etc. So because of that, you, you really are competing against your peers. So even though people start off not being competitive after a while, they're kind of looking at the results and seeing how they're doing against those of their own age. So I think because of that, it has a, a nice element to it. Yeah, well, listen, thanks very much for coming in and having a chat with us about the event. It's the 19th of May 19th in the National Aquatic Centre, and you can get all the information just by Googling uh, Europe Car Fing All Try. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me on, Claire and Breffney. Thank you. No Thank problem you. at all. Welcome back. Well, the past few years have been a bit of a gold, silver, and bronze era for our Irish female athletes. And coming up in our sporting spotlight, we meet the fastest woman on the block, Irish 100 metre sprinter Elise Maxweeney. Hi, and this week we're in Morton Stadium in Sandry. It's the home of Irish athletics, and we're joined by Ailish McSweeney, Irish 400 metre sprinter. Welcome to the show, Ailish. Thank you. This is your training base, so you're well used to here. Do you feel at home here? Oh, absolutely. I've been training here for about, I suppose, seven years now since I moved up to Dublin. So I'm here probably three to four times a week, more if we're, if we're in kind of sprint season, you know, indoors or outdoors. So yeah, I'm very comfortable with this track. You're from Cork. Talk to us about your club leave -in. Yeah, I joined Leeville when I was about 16. I did a bit of sprinting in school and it happened that the coach, the Leeville sprint coach, was our, our, also our coach in our school setup. So he encouraged me to come up and join their club. 
and um, I sprinted from when I was 16 in all those underage championships and kind of did well enough and then when I got to UCC it was great because I had the continuity there and still with the same coach John Sheehan and then started to take athletics a bit more seriously when I was around 19, 20, you know, turning up to all training sessions and just, you know, had a bit more drive and a bit more hunger for success and since then, you know, I've been kind of, um, I've been, you know, it's kind of been my passion and the one sport I settled down to. Okay, obviously, you're very well established on the on the Irish and the international scene. You've been to European Championships. You've been to World University Games as well. Izmir in two thousand and five was where you probably made your breakthrough in terms of the the general recognition outside of maybe your own club and your own area. Two medals at the World University Games. That must have been a pretty special time for you. Yeah, it was a great year. I had qualified for a World Student Games in two thousand and three, but I. It was too late with my qualification. I didn't know anything, to be honest, about any international competitions. So by the time 2005 came around, I was much more clued in, and it was a focus for me. And I had done pretty badly in the under-23 European Championships about a month or so before, but it just happened that I had just managed not to peak then. But by the time the University Games came around in Turkey a month later, you know, I was I was peaking, and I was, I was running as quick a time as I'd ever run in my life. I was running consistently, say, 11 sixes. Um, and got silver there. I was actually really disappointed not to win gold though because I'd beaten the girl who won gold in the semis. So I was I was actually really down about it for about a couple of hours and then realised, oh, a medal is pretty nice. Yeah, they don't come along that <laughs> yeah. often for most people. Uh, but you happened to pick up a second medal on that trip. Uh, you ran in the 4 by 100 metres with, with Derville and Emily Marr and I can't remember the fourth person. Anna Boyle as Anna well. Anna Boyle, yeah. Yeah, we had a great team. It was two days later, I think, so we picked up a bronze there as well, and some great memories of it. But it was a mad competition. Turkey's a bit of a crazy place um, for international competition, and I just remember it was an hour trek to the track. Every column for the race was 50 minutes. So I did that by, I think, six times for that competition. So you saw a lot of that call room. Yeah, so a lot of that call room, yeah, with all the rounds. But yeah, it was brilliant there. Uh, you know, you get a real good buzz off a relay team. It's so different to doing your individual event. So it was excellent. I suppose on the domestic scene, Santry for the national championships and maybe the Cork City Sports are probably two of the highlights of the year. You've had some pretty good success there as well. Cork City Sports is really important to me as a, a kind of a building block. I always got a real buzz off it and ran good times there. It was the first time I kind of broke from being an 11.9 runner to 11.6 runner, which, you know, it's, a, it's not a massive breakthrough, but it's a breakthrough when you're in your early 20s. And then, yeah, championships, national championships is something most Irish athletes get a really good buzz from. You know, it, there's, there's something special about running here and, and trying to win, win that title. But um, the city sports now, I must say, since they moved to CIT, it's a lot harder for sprinters. They've, the direction of the track has changed, the way they run into wind every year, and it doesn't have the same buzz for me, to be honest, as it did when it was in the Mardike, I must say. Well, obviously, as the UCC girl, that always yeah. wanted to feel for it as well. Some of your best successes have come indoors. Tell us about kind of what's the difference between an indoor event and an outdoor event, other than fact that it's actually indoors uh, yeah and the fact that it's a different distance actually yeah. the sprint is 60 meter indoor and 100 outdoor um i suppose for indoors the best thing being a sprinter is you don't have to worry about weather conditions at all or wind you know wind is a huge factor when you're a sprinter it just makes a massive difference to your times um but then it's also for people with very good starts 60 meters tends to be you know kind of one of your stronger um, events because it's, it's all about that drive phase you know that first 20 30 if you get out it's much harder to be caught whereas outdoor a 200 100 meter specialist might have that strength at the end but yeah i find it easier to qualify for those events the world indoors and the european indoors than i have for the outdoor events i think it's just the standard probably wasn't as high and then you know that really kind of helped me for my outdoor competitions just having that experience of going to major championships indoor so in 2010, you competed at the European Championships in both the 100 metres and the 4 by 100 metres. You missed out on a final place in both of them. How did it feel after that? It was tough. I remember myself and my coach Sean had to go down to doping control after the miss, missing out in the semi or missing out in the final. Sorry, of the 100 metres, and the final was on. That when we were down there, we were watching it on the TV screen, and that was kind of tough. But at the same time, I had ran 11.32 seconds with only a slight following wind, which would have been a massive PB for me, a big national record. So I, I kind of, you know, put it all out there. I didn't really leave anything behind on the track. So I was actually, I have to say, I was quite happy with my performance. And I thought, see, from there, I was going to build on that. So I was pretty happy. If I know what I knew now, that I would have been pretty injured since then, I probably, you know, would have been a bit more disappointed with not making that major final. But at the time I thought, 100 of a second, that's all I missed out on. You know, this won't happen to me again. I'm, I'm going to build on this. 
Um, and then in the relay, yeah, we missed out by 300. And I was running the last leg on that, so it was up to me to try and catch up and get that qualifying place. So that was pretty. Dis- that was nearly more disappointing because I did feel we had it in us to to qualify for a final, and we would have been able to bring Derville in then because she had a, her hurdles race that day. We would have brought her in for the final, and we probably would have smashed our national record. So that was that was pretty disappointing as well. What's more important to an athlete? Is it a medal? Is it a time? Or is it a record? I don't think you can say medals are the most important thing, definitely. But, I mean, there's not that many athletes that turn up the championship who are genuinely in the hunt for a medal. So then, if for them, it's probably qualifying through the rounds, trying to make the final. If it's not that, then it's your time. Did you pull out the best that you could on the day? You know, it's all kind of degrees of where you're at, I suppose. On the show most weeks, we talk to people who try and combine a day job with their sporting careers. Some manage to do it to various levels of, of success, but you've kind of had both worlds. Yeah, when I, I moved up to Dublin, I had a job in a law firm in El Good Body in the IFSC, and I combined my traineeship there with training. But, but to be honest, all those years I was just at a plateau. I, I couldn't, I couldn't improve on my times that I'd set when I, you know, was probably had a more relaxed lifestyle down in Cork. And when I qualified, I made the decision to ask for some time off and, you know, give it a shot to actually have a breakthrough. And straight away, I noticed the difference. You know, I, I ran two ten- tenths quicker over 100 metres than, than I'd ever ran before, which is a lot in 100 metre sprinting, you know. So I think for me, I probably couldn't combine them. Maybe in different jobs you could, but I had to try and leave work, say, at around half six, which would be very early by that firm standards and get to the track say by half seven because it closes here at nine you know so that's just not the ideal way to prepare for a training you're racing against the clock up early the next morning go again and for a sprinter it's all about recovery from your training that's actually how you get faster allowing your body to you know absorb what you've done in training and change and adapt and recover for the next session that's basically how you get faster you don't get faster by you know sprinting every hour of the day that god gave you so i just was missing that recovery time i think so since then, since I took that break, I went back for a few months after those European Championships in 2010 and then realised, look, if I did want to improve, I needed to, to try full-time athletics again. So I'm due back this October, <laughs> I don't know, three years later. Will you go back? Oh, yeah, I'll definitely go back. Yeah, I'm, I, you know, I'm looking forward to having a career and, and money coming in again. But, uh, you know, I'd need this summer to kind of count for that reason. London 2012 for you was one of your goals uh, due to injuries and was mainly injury uh, you didn't quite make that grade is that a regret well you can't regret something I suppose you didn't really have control over uh, I had to have surgery on my Achilles in December 2011 and so that was only a few short months eight months out from from the Olympics and it just just couldn't be done to be honest and um, I just had a, an injury that had been at me for I suppose the seven months leading up to that and the surgery, I was on crutches, I suppose, for a month and a bit after the surgery, and then it was gradually getting back, walking, jogging, running. So it just was never going to happen. I was still pretty optimistic that it might, even up to, say, May that year, I tried to run a race, but I was I couldn't even break 12 seconds just with what I'd missed out on. By then, it was you almost make that sound like that's slow. That's I know really, it is by your yeah, standards. Yeah. I know a lot of people watching the show, if they thought they could do it in 12 seconds, they'll be quite happy. But yeah. obviously, Olympics are a completely different kettle of fish. Is Rio one step too far? I think possibly. I've always thought if you want to um, be competitive internationally into your 30s, you probably have had to have success in your 20s. Because otherwise, how do you justify it? Or how are you getting funding if you haven't had that success to, to bring you there? So I suppose that's the dilemma I kind of face. But at the same time, we kind of take it year by year. If I had a fantastic summer this summer, I suppose I might start thinking differently. But, but for me, it's just about trying to run quicker than I've run before and kind of have a high you know that I can maybe go out on or <laughs> continue on I don't know which yet okay. obviously you studied in DCU uh, for a portion of your educational career uh, and you met uh, one Brian Cullen who is now your husband <laughs> uh, obviously viewers will be well familiar with Brian from his exploits on a GA pitch for Dublin um, how, how did that how did that work with having two elite athletes in the in the household um, the two elite athletes it's a great compliment for us um, no, it works national great. Champions. That's true, that's true. Um, it works out really well, you know, we're both, we, you know, we know what each other's about, like, you don't moan about someone going after training or, you know, saying, what are you up to this weekend? Oh, you have a match that's annoying, you know. 
the sport kind of almost comes first that's the thing you don't really question you know anyone's commitment to that and then even in terms of say nutrition and eating like we both be trying to live quite a healthy you know Would you eat similar lifestyle things? yeah more or less to be honest brian's it goes in at some stage one person might be really dedicated and good and you drag the other along with you you know so you know you kind of just like when i had a week off there recently i was seven days off in March and we've kind of three to four weeks off in September and that's your only window to eat junk so I probably had two McDonald's and a chipper that I was busy hiding in the outside bins because Brian would would not be into fast food at all he'd be you judging just, me you just told him anything He's yeah 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 back. I can tell him uh, you know a week or two later but I don't want to feel the the guilt straight after just enjoyed a nice uh, chipper What's your own Achilles heel? What's your own sweet tooth? My Achilles heel, that's a sore subject. But anyway, I know what you mean. Uh, probably a can of Coke. I do love a can of Coke. Um, but I'm trying out. I went off it for Lent there, and that's the only thing that will really stop me. So I need to kind of make up a, a self-imposed Lent, I think, from now to the end of the <laughs> the summer. Lent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yourself and Brian are both ambassadors for the Samsung Night Run. Obviously, a new introduction to the, the cityscape last year. It's coming back again this year, and this time you're the face of it. Yeah, it's on the 28th of April. It kicks off at 9 p.m., I think. But yeah, it's going to be very exciting. Brian's running it. I'm just supporting. And, you know, I How'd love... How you manage to get out of that? <laughs> yeah. I'm a big sprinter, Have you, you know. Have a big flag? Uh, I'll make one. Okay, yeah. cool. But no, it's, it's going to be amazing to see the city lit, lit up at night. Hopefully there'll be good weather for it. And I think it's supposed to be a real flat and fast course. So I'd say people, a lot of people will come out and try and run maybe quicker than they have before. Or if it's going to be a first 10k, you know, you'll set down a nice little marker for yourself. It does look like a pretty spectacular course up and down O'Connell Street and mm. out along the Keys. Uh, probably something that most people should check out if they're into a, a kind of middle to long distance run. Yeah, definitely. Nine percent of yourself, no? No, I, I'd be kicked out of my training group if I ran 10k because <laughs> we spent six days a week trying to get quicker and then I'd go off and run 10k, which would definitely make me slower. And I'd probably manage to pick up an injury while I was at it. So, yeah, it's out of the question for me, I'm afraid. Eilish, it's been fantastic having you on the show. Wish you the best of luck for everything you're doing for the summer. And uh, we'll have you on the show again soon. Thanks for having me. We have the Tavern Triathlon back again this week with adventure racer Avril Copeland. Welcome back to the second edition of the Tavern Triathlon. Somebody who's well used to a number of different disciplines on a single event is adventure racer Avril Copeland and she joins us for the second series, second event of the series. Avril, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks. Delighted to be here. Avril, what is an adventure racer? An adventure, adventure racer, an adventure race. And so basically I do, it's an endurance sport. So um, I got into this about 13 years ago when I lived in the States. And adventure racing is basically a multidiscipline race where you go from start to finish. So in the traditional sense of the word, adventure racing is start to finish and you have to navigate, navigate your way from start to finish with three other teammates. So there's four people on a team, it's a co-ed team of four. And you start to finish could be 600, 700 miles apart and you have to hit these checkpoints in order and navigate with map and compass to each checkpoint to get to the end. Along the way you'll cycle, kayak, climb, swim, anything from to get to start to finish. How long does that generally take? It normally takes, so the expedition races can take five to ten days. Wow. So non-stop through the night, like two, three hours sleep. How do you body, how do you body function on that kind of it's one of these things I think you just you learn to adjust and it's, um, you just keep going. It's just a matter of just keep moving. And adrenaline gets you there. Adrenaline and ibuprofen. Is the key. How do you train for something like that? Um, it's just lots of, lots of hours, lots of miles on the legs. So a lot of cycling, um, a lot of kayaking, a lot of running really are the main sort of core disciplines that you train. Which will be your personal favourite? Um, probably cycling to be honest. Probably cycling. I'm, like I enjoy kayaking but not like in freezing cold or the rain or anything else like that. Okay, so tell us a bit about you. You're a physio weight professional. Yeah. How do you end up doing this? What got well, you involved? I, when I was in school I played Irish hockey so I played sort of Irish international for till I was about 21 and I just made the senior team and then we missed qualification for the Olympics so then I went off to the States and when I was in the States I saw this race the Eco Challenge on television. Um, and I thought, God, it looks cool. And I wasn't playing any sport at the time, and I knew I needed some type of sport. So basically, I saw it on television, and I emailed the team that won the Eco Challenge, and they all emailed me back saying, Oh, yeah, go buy a bike, buy a kayak, and just sort of get into it. So that's sort of how I got into it. And then when I lived in the States, sort of, I came back to exercise science and studied that, and then studied physio. So, yeah, that's. 
you mentioned buying a bike and buying a kayak. Yeah. Obviously, they're not very cheap, and you can't just no. pick them up in your corner shop. No, absolutely. What kind of cost is involved in participating at this at the level you participate at, or it's, even just to it get is, into it? It's a, it's a really it is really expensive sport to, to get into initially because you have to if you think about all distance climbing, biking, kayaking, like you have to have the, you know really the most lightweight gear for each one because you're going over these amount of days. You know you don't want to be carrying a big heavy climbing harness or anything like that. So you're always going you know ultra lightweight ultra lightweight bike and um, so it is expensive initially to, to get the gear but you can all like I went second hand and got second hand kayak you know second hand bike initially just to sort of see if I even enjoyed it and um, but the the like our race in Costa Rica now at the end of the year like I'm using miles airline miles for that and you know the entry fee one race we did was a twelve thousand dollar US dollar entry fee for the team so a lot of help from sponsors is, is a great thing. <laughs> you know? It sounds outside the price range of a lot of people. Yeah. What's the entry level into the sport? Is there anything in Ireland that people can get involved in? Uh, yeah, there's lots of this. Uh, you know, adventure racing is becoming a really, really big thing, and there's lots of these new um, races like sport races, um, like the Killarney Adventure Race, Gale Force, and um, there's lots of these shorter distance races that you can sort of just get a feel for what it's like to go for a few hours. Talk to us about the Killarney event. I know you're involved in, in that. You're an ambassador for the event. Yeah. What's What's actually the, the distances that we're talking about there? What um, are the there's a fifty-two k. I can't remember the actual. Well, you know distances there's you know the sort of a shorter a shorter race and a longer race basically okay. so one sort of a tw I think it's 24 maybe for the for the um for you know total beginners okay. and then there's more you know a longer what, what, what do you have to do to cover the distance so one? it's um, running kayaking and cycling Okay. So uh, yeah, so it's a great. It's like a triathlon. But like a triathlon, like an off-road triathlon, basically. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We had Gavin Noble with us last week. Yeah, uh, we named this in his honor. Oh, uh, yeah. Just because we have. Yeah. Um, how do you feel you're going to get on an hour triathlon? Pretty confident. I don't know. Um, I, you know what? I don't play any darts. I um, don't play any pool. What's I, your sports knowledge like? Sports knowledge is woeful. Like I have to say, you know, I suppose a lot of this, this sport I'm out training, so I don't get a lot of time to that's be. Excuse yeah, I'm too busy training. <laughs> so to, putting my excuses out there to now. To squat up on what's happening <laughs> and playing pictures exactly, of the world. Exactly. Okay, exactly. well, listen, we're going to put you to the test. So let's see how you go. Thanks, Amelia. Thank you very much. In boxing, who was the Celtic warrior? Uh, Barry Morgan. Steve Collins. In the 2002 FIFA World Cup, an uncle and nephew played for Ireland. Who were they? Uh, I don't know, Rashford. 
Ashes, um, Paki Bonner and Ray Hagen. No, neither played. <laughs> uh, Gary Kelly and Ian Hart. What events make up a triathlon? Swimming, cycling, and running. Yeah, that's an easy one for you. Uh, in question four, name four events that make up the modern pentathlon. Four of the five. Fencing. Correct. Horse riding. Dressage. Show jumping. Show jumping. I'll give you horse riding, yeah. One more. Um, swimming? Correct. Uh, the other one was shooting. Four out of four in that round. And the final question. Name the last five counties to lift the Lee McCarthy Cup at the All Ireland Hurling Championship. <laughs> the last five counties yes. for, for hurling. hurling. Dublin? Nope. <laughs> Kerry? Nope. Three more answers. Cork? Correct. In 2005 was the last time they won it. Oh, that's it. Yeah, 2005. Um, <laughs> I get the feeling this could be a stab in the dark. <laughs> Slightly. I'm just thinking of Kerry. Um... And a huge congratulations to Avril Copeland, who now overtakes Gavin Noble at the top of the leaderboard. And there is only two of them there. <laughs> Wait a couple of weeks and we'll see where the ladies and the, and the lads figure in the, oh, in the yeah, whole we'll standings. See those. That is it for the week. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for, for the last hour while we brought you the best in what's happening on the courts and pitches of the city. And you can find out more at sundaysportshow.com or find us on Facebook and Twitter. So if you'd like to feature on the show for yourself or your club, please do pop us a line and invite us along. And we look forward to talking to you again next week. See you then.